This interactive training video explains some of the basic 2D auto meshing functionalities in HyperMesh. Let's start by choosing the mesh option from the toolbar. As this video is for 2D auto meshing, we choose the 2D auto meshing option. Let us select all displayed surfaces by using one of the advanced selection options. We now need to specify the element size. We will start with 3 mm. Typically you need to run the analysis multiple times to understand the influence of the mesh size on the results. Of course, the modeling results should not depend on the mesh size. In the next step, we specify the element type to be used for meshing. Clicking on the selector will prompt a list of available mesh types. Depending on the project requirements, you may choose quad, tria, mixed, or trias, or a quad-only mesh. In most cases you will start with the mixed mesh type which is our default setting. The mixed mesh type creates a quad element dominated mesh. Changes in the element density across a surface is accommodated by tri elements. This typically yields a very smooth and homogeneous mesh. In the course of this demo, we will mesh the same model using different mesh types. As we are making our way through the panel from the left to the right, the next step is related to the definition of the target component collector. Do you have any ideas of what this is? I hope that you can answer this question. The option, Elements to Serve Comp, tells HyperMesh to place the elements in the component collector which contains the surfaces to be meshed. Hence, if the surfaces are stored in different component collectors, the elements will be stored in different component collectors as well. The setting, elements to current comp simply neglects where the surfaces are coming from. In this case, all elements will be moved to the current or active component. As a reminder, with the right mouse button click in the model browser, you can set a component to be active or current. If there is no component collector set to be current, then HyperMesh will create a component collector named, Auto. By default, linear elements will be created. Linear elements are also called, First order elements. The first order elements only have nodes at their corners. Note, you can create first order elements, and then convert them to second order elements later. This conversion does not require any remeshing. Notice the highlighted panel. By default the interactive meshing mode is active. This allows you to change manually, for instance, mesh size or type during the meshing process. Alternatively, the automatic mode may be chosen. In this case, the mesh will be created with respect to the given meshing parameters. No further interaction is possible or required. Personally, I use the automatic mode while dealing with larger models. This mesh is a draft mesh, which is used to learn more about common meshing problems. For instance, which areas of the model need further refinement, how many elements are created etc. Based on these findings, the interactive mode is then used in the next step, where attention is particularly paid to the problematic areas spotted before. After all these explanations, let us create our very first mesh. The highlighted, so-called secondary panel is only accessible when in the interactive meshing mode. In this kind of preview mode, the mesh will be displayed in a green color, regardless of its associated component collector color. The yellow nodes indicate distinct corners of the surfaces. The depicted numbers correspond to the number of nodes along the surface edges. Let's zoom in to view some details. By the way, did you notice the cyan colored frame? Do you remember what its meaning is? As we are in the density subpanel, the option, Adjust Edge simply allows us to interactively change the nodal density along an edge. But before adjusting anything, please note the overall mesh pattern. In the highlighted surface you see nicely aligned quad elements. There are a few trias which accommodate the density contrast of the opposing surface edges, for instance, 13 nodes on the left, and 10 nodes on the right side. Keep this characteristic mesh pattern in mind, 
you will see it in many reports and papers. And now, let us change the nodal density of the lower edge from 21 nodes down to 20. A right mouse button click will reduce its density, a left mouse button click will increase. One more right mouse button click will decrease the nodal density from 20 to 19. The new nodal distribution is shown in the preview mode. In order to update the mesh, we need to activate the mesh button again. The objective of the next steps is to increase the number of nodes along the edge on the right side of the surface from 10 to 13. This can be accomplished through three left mouse button clicks. And again, from 11 to 12 nodes. And once more, from 12 to 13 nodes. All we need to do now is update the mesh by clicking the mesh button. Only one try element is left due to the nodal differences at the upper and lower edges of the surface. In the next phase of this exercise, we want to see what the mesh would look like if we used larger elements. Instead of re-entering the auto mesh panel, we simply specify a new element size in this panel. The new element size will be 5 mm. Based on the new element size, the new nodal discretization needs to be calculated. It is obvious that the spacing between the nodes will become larger. In order to update the mesh, click the mesh button. This is the mesh preview regarding an element size of 5 mm, in combination with the mesh type mixed. Again, some try elements accommodate the nodal density differences of opposing edges. In case you dislike the process of manually adjusting the nodal density, you may activate the option Link Opposite Edges. The option Link Opposite Edges will assign the kind of average nodal density to opposite edges, respectively. Of course, we need to recalculate the new nodal distribution first. Notice the new nodal density distribution which is now the same on opposite surface edges, respectively. Nice mesh, isn't it? You may wonder, why this option is not enabled by default. This is because, practice shows, that strongly tapered surfaces will cause elements to have a rather poor length to height aspect ratio. For the remaining part of this exercise, we will keep the option, link opposing edges, disabled. Disabling the option, Link Opposing Edges requires a recalculation of the nodal distribution. Now we are looking at the functionalities available in the sub-panel named Mesh Style. Entering the sub-panel, Mesh Style, is changing the displayed mesh information in the graphics area. Instead of numbers referring to the nodal density, we now see colored symbols. Actually, there is one such symbol per surface. What do the symbols tell us? To answer this question, we have to notice that the option, Mesh Method is currently active, as indicated by the cyan colored frame. Hence, the symbols tell us what kind of meshing method, or meshing algorithm was used in that particular surface. However, the topic meshing method goes beyond the scope of this basic introduction. Instead we rather focus on the option named, Elem Type. You came across Elem Type before. Do you remember what its meaning is? Activating the option, Toggle Surface Beneath a Limb Type changes the displayed symbols instantaneously. What is the Surface Toggle command? It simply changes the mesh type being used for meshing. As you will see in a moment, clicking on the highlighted symbol, will change the mesh type from Mixed, to our Trias. To make the new mesh type become active, we need to mesh the surface again. It is quite apparent that our trias are no more than quad elements that have been split along their shortest diagonal. The R trias elements contain an enclosed angle of about 90 degrees. Let's see how the mesh layout will change. If mesh type, quad only is used, toggling the surface again will bring up the mesh type, trias. The regular trias ideally enclose 60 degree angles, respectively. And finally, Mesh Type Quad Note, Mesh Type Quad attempts to create a mesh consisting of quads only. However, it is normally wishful thinking. In this particular surface, we do not observe any differences between a quad and quad only mesh. We are back at the beginning, Mesh Type Mixed and 3mm Elements. If you feel, toggling surfaces until the desired mesh type is shown is tedious then you may use one of the following options. 
Select the mesh type of interest first. Here we want to try out regular try elements, and then chose whether this mesh type should be assigned to selected surfaces, or to all surfaces. Here, we want to assign the mesh type try to all surfaces. Mind the updated mesh type symbols. Let's mesh all surfaces with quad elements. Pretty easy, isn't it? Once more we are going back to the initial mesh based on 3mm elements and mesh type mixed. We will use this type of mesh in the course of the next modeling steps, namely to check element quality and if needed, element repair. Clicking on return will close the secondary meshing menu. As you may have noticed, the mesh color has changed according to the color of its associated component collector. Sometimes, it may occur that immediately after meshing, the mesh is not visible. Why is this and how do we fix it? First of all, make sure to check the settings of the component collector in the model browser. It sometimes happens, due to your working history, that the display of the elements is simply disabled. A simple settings check and fix. Another issue you may be confronted with is that the mesh is displayed, but you can hardly see some spots of the model. We pan the model in order to view such spots. Do you see the problem? The mesh is displayed, but apparently it is missing in the fillet area. Again, the solution is rather easy. The geometry shading is still active in overlying the mesh information. Hence, just change the geometry style from shaded to wireframe. Finally, this completes the interactive video about the basics of 2D mesh.